speaking. We are here today at the Gables for Memories of Messiah in Rutland. And my two distinguished guests are Betty Clark and Alistair Stout, who represent a continuity of over 60 years of performances in Rutland of Handel's Messiah. We do know that Messiah had a two-century history in the United States from the founding of the Handel and Haydn Society in 1815. Our first documented performance in Rutland goes back to 1870 by the Rutland Choral Society, who performed in the rooms of the YMCA. December performances began as a collaboration of Protestant churches. In 1956, Robert English, organist and choir director at Trinity Church, worked with organist Leo Ayen at Grace. And over 500 people filled Trinity Church in 1959. Leo died suddenly in 1961, age 47, from a stroke. And in 1961, the organist, as she was described in the Rutland Herald, Mrs. Richard A. Clark, played at the Baptist Church. By 1964, 10 Rutland churches collaborated in what was widely touted as an ecumenical concert with 180 in the choir, including the Sisters of St. Joseph in the Old Habits. Uh, some of our photos that you'll see show Horace Hollister directing with Betty in 1969. Our next photo shows Alan Walker, whom we plan to be, have here today, in 1974. And lastly, that brings us to Alistair, who began his tenure as Minister of Music at Grace in 2017. So a few fun facts. I first encountered Betty Clark on an October day 40 years ago at a noontime recital at Trinity Church. And two months later, I attended my first performance of Messiah at Grace with Betty at the organ and Alan Walker conducting. Now Betty, an extraordinarily talented woman, is ferociously mo uh, modest about her accomplishments, but I will tell you that she was a Fulbright scholar and studied with world-famous organist Helmut Volka. Mm -hmm. Betty served as organist and choir director at Trinity Church until she retired uh, in 2003. But we know that musicians never really uh, retire. Uh, Alan Walker, uh, who could not be with us, uh, had been Minister of Music at Grace from 1974 through 1992. And one of my favorite facts about Alan is that he is in the Pilgrim Hymnal. So here he is. And at some point, uh, this lovely prayer would be appropriate for me to sing sometime before uh, I preach the gospel in Pittsburgh. I asked our mutual friend, Jim Casarino, to say something about Betty uh, and Alan. And he wrote, during their tenures, Alan and Betty's collaborations presented the community with high quality music rarely found in a city the size of Rutland. Their work was foundational to the local music community, which is still felt today. They were models for me during my early musical formation, especially as an organist. And in these overlapping circles of friendship, we have Alistair, who came to us from Pittsburgh, via London, and the Shetland Islands. And he is possibly the only Ely Cathedral boy chorister presently living in Rutland. So, Betty, let's talk about Messiah. And what are some of your favorite memories in Messiah going back to those early days? I guess the, my favorite memory is of the bass soloist, who was the first bass soloist in, when I was playing. And I don't, I can't tell you how many years he was there. His name was Robert Mosley, mm. and he came from Pittsburgh. <laughs> and uh, I think Horace Hollister had known him, 
because Horace was at Grace then. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's how he got to Rutland, because mm -hmm. Bob had been touring with a national touring company of Porgy and Bess mm -hmm. at one time during those years. And he was here for quite a few years as a bass soloist. And when he sang, Thus saith the Lord, it was like a thunderbolt mm -hmm. came into Grace Church. <laughs> He was a wonderful singer and a wonderful person, became a great friend of mine, and, of, and he had been of Horace's too. And uh, it was, he was one of those musicians that you don't forget knowing. He brought out the best in the accompanists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember afternoons of tea and Schubert Leader with him, mm -hmm. <laughs> my house and Horace's. And I guess um, I was thinking, the main memories I have of Messiah of all those years is not so much the music, which is, you know, we all know what the music does, but of the, the people con context that, that Al, Alan and um, Bob Mosley and Horace, and now I hope Alistair, <laughs> um, just became wonderful friends, musical friends and personal friends. And I used to say, if I went into the Grand Union or a grocery store in Rutland and somebody spoke to me by name that I didn't know, I knew it was somebody who had sung in the Messiah Chorus. <laughs> <laughs> the numbers uh, were large in, in those days, mm -hmm. um, so close to 200 yes, at I one think point. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mostly those are the kinds so of So before we turn to uh, Alistair's more recent history, uh, in your uh, life as a musician, how did you first encounter Messiah? I think it was here, probably. I mean, of course, I knew about it, but I had never played it before 1961. Mm -hmm. And I just knew it by ear, and mm -hmm. what, that's what it was and its history. But it was my connection, it really, really began with the Rutland performances. Mm -hmm. And that was a you know, most people in Rutland know me because of Messiah. <laughs> it was a major influence in my life for all those years. Mm -hmm. And I loved doing it. Uh, after um, Alan um, brought uh, an orchestra into the picture, Betty, did you uh, play continue or did you, or what was your position after that? I, I pretty much played continue yeah. parts through everything, yes. Yeah, yeah, not, yeah. You know, not, not right. all like Regents, but, yeah. Yeah. but everything, yes, it was mm. still pretty much, it was, Less playing, right. but it was right. it was continuous through yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And also, it, I mean, in addition to the chorus people and the conductors, it also let me become acquainted with a lot of good musicians in the orchestra mm. after Alan came to, because mm. there were some great people in those mm. orchestras. What kind of size orchestra did he introduce back then? Uh, I don't think it was much different. Okay. Exactly. Alan would know yeah. exactly how many, but it was, I think it, was a, it wasn't a, a small handle-sized orchestra, but it was more like your size, okay. I think. Yeah. I can't tell you exactly mm. that. Mm. You might be able to tell you the people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Alistair, um, in your uh, musical studies, which began as a child, what were some of your early encounters uh, of Messiah? Uh, well, I, you know, I did sing it when I was um, a chorister at Ely, so that was back when I was um, 12, 13 years old, you know, um, we sang it in the cathedral. So I guess that was my first encounter with it back then um, in, in a cathedral environment with orchestra and soloists. Um, and then <clears throat> didn't really uh, do much with it during my college years, you know, I was occupied with other things. So really, again, coming to Rutland, um, uh, was the first time in terms of directing it um, and um, getting to know the music again. Um, so kind of an early piece for me and then more recent uh, in that respect. Um, but it certainly didn't lose, uh, lose any of its appeal and I remember as a 12 year old in the cathedral it was a very exciting, you know, um, dramatic experience uh, to encounter. Uh, and really interesting again, I guess, to discover it a little bit later in life with a little bit more musicality behind me um, and to see the potential again of what the Messiah can do. Uh, you know, we know it's a wonderful piece for um, a passionate but amateur uh, choral group to take on. I mean, it's very manageable. Um, there are some moments, obviously, that are challenging, but it's wonderful to see the chorus rise to those occasions, which the Rutland Area Chorus always has done. Um, 
the past few years at Grace, we've um, injected a bit more drama in the music. Uh, we, we've added some, um, uh, well, we've added some dance, which I think is a really important part of the piece. Uh, uh, I remember uh, one of my professors uh, in London, when we studied the Baroque kind of era, you know, we, he, would, he would actually uh, encourage us to go to Baroque dance lessons, you know, and actually te physically uh, you know, dance those dances so that you can really get a sense of the rhythm and the, the meter and the and the kind of pacing of the of the rhythm. And that's what I tried to um, get the singers to understand by introducing dance into the Messiah performance. Is that it's just so vital to feel the music as well as sing it. You know, and I think hopefully watching the dance or if they possibly can taking part in it, you know, they really get a sense of of some of that movement. Um, and then um, just using the space, Grace Church, as, as we know, is, is just a wonderful space to explore. And it's got lots of different areas, lots of different potential. And so um, having, you know, the, the bass, for instance, when he first comes in, that dust set the Lord, that wonderful uh, declamatory entrance, you know, he comes through the front doors there at Grace and announces this wonderful news. Rather than just having statics up at the front, we've got a bit of movement and a bit, a bit more drama and gestures to it. So I tried to introduce that um, side of things too. We've also had the bagpipes, and I know that's not to everybody's taste, but you know, um, that, that's exactly what um, Handel was trying to portray, was this, uh, uh, these pipes in the shepherd's field. You know, so from a distance, we've got a wonderful piper at Grace Church. What, why not um, you know, encourage the community to be involved in this piece, which again, I think is what it's all about here, mm -hmm. is um, a community experience, um, getting people together to sing and, and explore, um, um, uh, you know, a really magnificent piece of music. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, and like um, Betty was saying, we, we've, we've reduced the orchestra a little bit from what it was, say, 10, 15 years ago, um, to uh, make it a little bit more agile. Um, that, that we've got, I think, three violins, two violas, two cellos, uh, a little bit like the chorus post-COVID. You know, it's not as big as it used to be, but I don't think quantity is the point. <laughs> you know, we're looking for, for quality, and I think uh, a group of, say, 60, 70 singers and an orchestra of about 25 is very manageable, and, and you can mould that, I think, uh, and, and have really great effects uh, rather than having a, a massive force. So um, I think for the time being, it's working really well, having this, the, the numbers we do um, to, um, to kind of shape the piece and to get across what I, what I think uh, Handel was, um, was saying in it. Um, so that's been really exciting um, to do that. And again, like Betty said, just to get to know not just the soloists who are really magnificent you know, musicians. Um, and really importantly, we've used lots of local soloists. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, for instance, this, this year and last year, we've had Ryan Mangan sing the tenor part. And Ryan is a wonderful tenor from Rutland. And um, so to be able to actually explore and utilize local talent, it's just very, very close to my heart. And I think r really a very important part of what Grace Church is and also what the Messiah is to Rutland, you know, so. And mostly local musicians do in the orchestra mm -hmm. um, who are become very good friends and, and, uh, and it's, it's wonderful to make music with people that you really, really like and really respect mm -hmm. and uh, certainly found that um, in the, the Grace Church um, uh, Messiah you know, production. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. What's been really interesting, Michael, is during COVID we were, we were unable to do a, um, you know, a performance of the Messiah so we actually took it behind the scenes and we recorded a digital version of Messiah and uh, that also allowed us to really explore the different areas of Grace Church so we had the darkness movements with the sun up in the in the catwalks of the of the ceiling of the sanctuary you know where it's dark and gloomy and the lighting effects were fantastic um, we had um, you know parts sung down in the basement we had decorations and we were able to move from you know the beginning of the Messiah which is all this dark chaos and uh, gradually it forms into this beautiful majesty of, of Jesus coming down from heaven. And so we went from the darkness of the church to the lightness of the most beautiful rooms with, with um, decorations, you know. And we could really tell the story, I think, in, a, in quite a remarkable way um, during those, um, those strange couple of years of COVID, you know. So we made it happen even though we weren't able to sing. Mm -hmm. Michael. That Alistair reminds me of something I meant to say. The first soprano soloist that I played for was Shirley Smith, and oh. there will be, she was a, a, a member of the Grace Choir for many mm. years, 
and sang the soprano solos for many years in Messiah and it became, a, again, a good friend of mine. There will be people still in the area who will remember Shirley mm -hmm. and who died this last year. Uh -huh. And I didn't want to mention Shirley because she had been an important part of that too, when the, a local singer. And somebody else who's local who also is singing this year is uh, Gretchen Dorian. And Gretchen yes, used to sing yes, and she, she was with Alan Walker. Yes. I mean, I believe that. And, and yes. she often oh, yes, recalls indeed. to me the Alan Walker years at Christchurch yes, with yes, much, much love yes, and respect. So it's yes. great to have Gretchen um, mm -hmm. sing. I think this yes. is the first time, suddenly in my time, I think that she's sung. So, uh, so you know, there have been a lot of local solos yeah. who were you right. know, some better than others, right. but but, um, but I, I do remember in 1982 my first performance uh, watching you, uh, Judith Ball. Oh, Judith Ball! Uh, I was trying to yeah, remember. and uh, the alto, Wonderful and I met alto. her a little bit later. And, and I said, you sang a Messiah, and she said, I'm now Mrs. Winston Churchill. Uh, but she has a lovely voice, became a good friend. Um, An untrained years. voice oh. and just gorgeous voice. Oh. Yeah. Well, what's wonderful this year is Amy, our uh, alto soloist, who is really fantastic, has brought her 14-year-old son to join the chorus. Well, and yes, Max has been singing. There is that. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and there is that familiar Absolutely. Connection. And also that yes. younger generation, that it's just so vital mm -hmm. to seeing this piece progress for mm -hmm. years ahead. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it's been really great to see that and, and the uh, the more, um, not mature, but well, the people that have sung it for years, you know, are now bringing in their kids and it's just really fantastic to see that growth is, happen yes, in the is. bottom half. So. There are many families like that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think the versatility of Messiah in what's happened in recent years, Handel would approve of because after all, he had a long run in theatrical impossible plot operas uh, before Messiah. And I think that it's astonishing that what would have been regarded as religiously radical in 1741 and it would have been denounced by some of the clergy um, has become such a Christmas staple. Mm -hmm. And I, I think for me there are two things that have happened in my own life uh, with Messiah because I think it's a wonderful piece of music. It grows with us. Mm -hmm. And we think about how we measure ourselves mm -hmm. against previous, uh, mm -hmm. previous performances. But, but certainly as a child, I love the Robert Shaw chorales. And so mm -hmm. for me, Messiah started with the Hallelujah Chorus. Mm -hmm. yes. And then once upon a time, you could get box record sets through the Book of the Month Club. Mm -hmm. And the Handel and Haydn Society had a five LP set. But I think the whole, uh, I did not sing in Messiah until after I retired from teaching, so that was your second year. And it really is thrilling to be on the inside of a piece of music mm -hmm. that you know uh, and love mm -hmm. so well. And I think the other thing that uh, Alistair also brings to his performances is to really pay attention to text. And I think that one of the undervalued aspects of Messiah is the role that Charles Jenis had uh, in taking uh, rather disparate uh, verses of the Old Testament and the New Testament and packing, packaging them in a way that seems so familiar to us. So now, when I pick up Isaiah, there are certain texts they just sing in my head because it's Messiah. It may not be something that biblical scholars all agree with, but I, I think that is also um, a debt that Handel had to his friend Charles Jennings, whom he remembered in his will, by the way, uh, which he revisited two days before he died, and he left uh, generous bequests to his many friends. Mm. So he was part of that London social mm -hmm. scene. So Alistair, this year, um, we, you, you have done many things to keep Messiah fresh. So this year in particular, tell us what um, is going to happen to juxtapose Messiah to new music. Mm. So um, for the last couple of years, we've, we've introduced the um, Grace Church Composition Competition, which is a competition that encourages new music that is inspired and uh, influenced by uh, Handel's Messiah. So uh, it's open to composers all through the, the world and, and uh, the, the, you know, they have to write a piece that's basically for chorus and orchestra. I mean, it's a, a wonderful, um, you know, uh, uh, 
we've got a great orchestra and a great chorus, so uh, a great opportunity basically to, to write for. This year we had um, a number of different uh, entries from all over the world actually, and so the winning piece was by a New Zealand composer, his name's Chris Artley, and um, you can actually hear Chris talk about his piece on the Grace Church website. So I think one way to keep the piece fresh, although the Messiah doesn't really need to be kept fresh. I, I think that there's so much about it that um, leaps off the page every time I open the score. Um, but I think that a way to, it, to introduce it to the audience and to keep, um, you know, um, a, a audience kind of uh, on, the, on the tips of their toes is to see how it can influence other composers. So um, a couple of years ago, Michael Sitton, who was a local Vermont composer, he was the, he won it in, in 2019. Uh, wrote a wonderful piece for soloists, choir and orchestra. And uh, Chris Artley's piece this year is a setting of uh, a Sarah Teasdale poem, Christmas poem, and um, sets it in a very, very beautiful um, lyrical fashion for chorus and um, an orchestra. Uh, and we're also uh, performing a piece by Bach, one of Bach's cantatas, a Savior of the Nations, come BVWV 61. He actually wrote two settings, 61 and 62, and we did 62 a couple of years ago. But this is 61, and um, the theme of that uh, um, cantata, uh, the famous hymn, Saviour of Nations Come, Bach uh, hides it and uh, um, develops it in the most fantastic ways. And I think something, I think the handle is um, very obviously very well written, but um, it's kind of, um, it's transparent. Everything is really there for you to hear and see. That's what's so wonderful about it. It's, uh, you know, it, it's very accessible because it's right there in front of your ears and in front of your eyes to hear. The Bach, I think, has got a little bit more layer to it. And so what, I'm, what we're doing is stripping away those layers in the Bach so you can uncover these gems of ideas and these beautiful sounds. We go through the Artley, which is a new piece based, uh, influenced and inspired on the Messiah, and then we get to the Messiah and you, and you see uh, the glory that, that Handel put together in that. So um, those are the three, those are the two pieces that will be um, juxtaposed with, uh, with the Messiah this year, and I, I'll play you a little bit of the um, Artley piece uh, before we finish today to show you how that goes. What was interesting, just to go back to talking about Jenna's, is that um, although Handel, you know, did le leave uh, something in his Wolfram, they, they during the Messiah process, they weren't that friendly. You know, Jenna, Jenna's kept saying to Handel, I think you could do better. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and Handel disagreed. He did not improve it. You know, he thought it was, as, yeah, and it is, yeah. it's great. But what's interesting is that Handel would rewrite parts of the Messiah over the years to allow for the different performers and the different, um, uh, you know, locations and situations that he found himself in. So when, we, when you look at the Messiah and you look at the Grace Church production of Messiah, and if you you think to yourself, well, what on earth is going on with these bagpipes? Or, uh, you know, what are the dancers doing? I, I think that there's something in the music that, that Handel would agree with in that respect, in the way that he would often, uh, you know, um, transpose a, a movement for an alto that couldn't reach too high. So, so th there was a kind of leeway um, that always kept the piece fresh in that respect. He always was aware of his performers. And I think as a composer, that's such an important thing to be aware of, is, is what the capabilities are and where the, your performers shine. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, I think, why we're allowed. In some, we obviously wouldn't do anything to the actual notes themselves. But uh, I think there is leeway, and, and I think Handel would, be, would absolutely allow us to, to look inside the music and, and find uh, the best possible way to put the piece across in the in the area and the situation that you're in you know luckily we're in a wonderful situation at Grace Church but at the same time I think there is still time to explore and room to really look at what's going on there and I think you see that in Handel's own performances too you know um, so I think we're extraordinarily lucky that uh, Messiah has been played almost continuously somewhere since its creation and there are great musical compositions like some of Bach's cantatas mm -hmm. that if Mendelssohn hadn't rescued them they would have been lost uh, mm -hmm. to history. So it's wonderful uh, to have this conversation uh, with both of you. Um, I look forward to being part of the performance this weekend and uh, there was one year that we had a disaster uh, for weather. Mm. And it was blizzard conditions, but the show went on. Mm -hmm. And this is the lady who used to live on, uh, on top of a hill in Chittenden. Mm. So uh, <laughs> um, she would not hear sob stories about people who could not make it to choir practice or make it to the performance. And um, as we conclude our time together today, Alistair, we look forward to you playing something from the Artley composition. So once again, this has been our show. 
uh, Memories of Messiah in Rutland.